I'm going to be showing you a PowerPoint about the work that we've done in Richmond, some of the phenomenal work we've done on a local level to um, beat back against uh, the, this one percenter in our city, the Chevron Richmond refinery, um, that has spent an enormous amount of money to try and hold back the progressive movement in Richmond. But we have defeated them time and time again, which goes to show you that people can win. So. Um, I'm hoping we can dim the lights a little bit. So Richmond, California, we're a local community defining our own destiny. Next. So uh, this PowerPoint is divided into three parts. Um, we are really rising from um, a, a situation and a history of despair and scarcity in Richmond. Uh, I've divided this PowerPoint into three parts. First, the Chevron uh, versus Richmond, Richmond versus Chevron, I should say. Um, where we stood up to the oil giant in our city. The second part is about income inequality and some of our successes and ongoing challenges. And the third part is housing challenges, um, foreclosure prevention and rent control, something that um, is a very recent thing that we're working on in Richmond, have some challenges with that. So next. Next. So. Um, in many ways, our 2014 battle was ground zero with Chevron, and it has a global impact because Chevron is the largest, um, the single largest greenhouse gas emitter in the state of California, right there in our city, our uh, Chevron Richmond refinery, 112 years old, been polluting our community for years. <laughs> Next. So what is their bottom line? Well, we know that the refinery is responsible for 10% of Chevron's worldwide sales and profits, averaging $25 billion in sales and $2.5 billion in profits because of that one refinery that Chevron has in Richmond. $2.5 billion in profits a year while our community gets uh, health problems and lives in poverty. Um, it's... Uh, $25 billion a year in sales makes it uh, roughly number 110 in the Fortune 500. 94% um, of their $40 billion a year capital budget goes to oil and gas exploration. Only 3% goes to making their refineries um, and chemical plants safe and low emission, as they should be. Next. So. This is a compelling story that we have in Richmond. We think um, that people have, it's captured the imagination of many. But because as giants like Chevron and other corporations increasingly dominate our public and private lives, it's imperative to have these successes where the little guy can overcome the big oil bully. Next. So Richmond is David, right? You know, we're the little guy. Population 108,000. I mean, we're kind of a mid-sized city in the Bay Area. We have 18.5% of our population still living under poverty. For, we're a majority people of color community, 40% Latino, 27% African American. Next. So as I said before, it's uh, the, first of all, Goliath, of course, is Chevron Richmond Refinery, a single largest greenhouse gas polluter in California. Um, actually, now this, uh, this figure is going up to 5.8 million tons of greenhouse gases each year um, and so many other co-pollutants that uh, come into our air and into our lungs in Richmond. Um, it produces 40% of all the greenhouse gases in the Bay Area and 80% of Richmond's pollution. Next. So. We stand up. Richmond stands up to Goliath. David stands up to Goliath. We have, we've done it. We've done it time and time again. We have climate marches, climate justice marches. We stand up for, um, for um, um, environmental justice. Um, just have, we had 3,000 people come to Richmond um, to protest um, a year after a major fire, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Next. So this is a, 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 a slide about the building environmental movement in Richmond, where people come to Richmond, not only from Richmond, but from outside of Richmond. 3,000 people protested Chevron in August of 13, and then hundreds every year. It's on the anniversary of a major fire that we had in 2012. We have these 
um, events and activities. The first one, the first anniversary was major. We had, you know, like I said, 3,000 people marching from Richmond BART to the refinery, and it was a great, great uh, event. Next. So after decades of Chevron domination, ordinary people in Richmond have organized and stood up to the oil giant. And we know when spiders unite, they can tie down a lion. That's an Ethiopian, <laughs> Ethiopian uh, proverb. Next. So one of our major victories was this past 2014. We ran a slate. I had termed out as mayor after eight years as mayor. And I decided to run for city council so I could continue the work um, that we had started and that we were transforming um, Richmond um, by way of. Um, so myself, Jovanka Beckles, and Eduardo Martinez were uh, what we called Team Richmond versus Team Chevron, because Team Chevron had their candidates out there too. Um, so we had, back a bit. So um, these are just some of the victories. We had a, um, my victory for council, my victory for mayor, and we had another ca candidate for a while who won his race, Jeff Ritterman, and then um, uh, Jovanka won her, can her race um, in 2010 as I run my reelection campaign, and then our latest victory where we had a clean sweep. All our progressive campaigns won. And, and all of Chevron candidates lost. So uh, we, we know it can be done. Next. So over the past 10 years, Chevron's control of the city government has been challenged and released. Now, how have we done that? In two ways. By a grassroots movement, and that also includes coalition building with other um, organizations. But our Richmond Progressive Alliance is, is an organization that likes to, that works at tying things together. Not only do we run candidates and endorse candidates who take no corporate money, but we also um, uh, build that uh, kind of, we, we are that glue that brings people and organizations together. So the other thing is, of course, the election of council candidates or of, uh, council members, and when I was mayor, my election, um, who cannot be bought. And that's very important in a city of that has had decades of corruption prior uh, to a decade ago. So uh, we were outspent 20 to 1 in 2014. And like I said, uh, we all won. Chevron lost. Next. So to give you an idea of how much this local campaign was facing, um, Chevron spent, this is on a city of 108,000, Chevron spent over $3 million to try and elect a pro-oil, anti-environmental uh, candidate slate in November 2014. And the reason they wanted a pro-Chevron city council would be to settle we are suing Chevron, the city of Richmond, and I made sure of that when I was mayor, that we needed to sue them for the fire of 2012, which sent 15,000 people to local hospitals for respiratory treatment. So it was a big thing. It, it spread all the way to San Francisco. So um, we, uh, the city council, I had to work hard to get my colleagues to join me in that, not my progressive colleagues, but the others. Um, to uh, make sure that uh, we did file a lawsuit. So Chevron, of course, wanted to elect a pro-Chevron city council who would settle the lawsuit for pennies, right? But we, we wanted something different. We want to hold them accountable. Next. So um, just to let you know what they did with that $3 million, they bought up every billboard in town with attack pieces on me and my, my council um, colleagues that were running with me, and they had, you know, mailers just, just inundating people's mailboxes every single day for two months uh, prior to the campaign. They, they were all over social media. They, they had their own fake newspaper. They were everywhere trying to convince people, but we were out there knocking on doors. We were at community events. We had mailers going to people's households, but we made those real, we made good use of our money. We made sure that uh, we had a newspaper called the Richmond Sun, you know, telling all the good things happening in Richmond that progressives were responsible for, as well as, um, you know, promoting our candidates. So we made good use of our money. They just really turned people off with just overkill on all their materials and the really ridiculous attacks that they were making. It was, it was really outrageous. They were attacking me like I was never in Richmond. It was, there was one 
uh, billboard that was all, in fact, it was in Berkeley as well as in Richmond. They, they went beyond Richmond to portray me as someone who um, was, you know, a globe trotter because I went to Ecuador for five days, mind you, um, <laughs> to, see the, uh, to see the contamination of the Amazon, uh, the Ecuadorian Amazon rainforest that Chevron is responsible for cleaning up. And so, you know, they, they try and uh, distort the truth, but, but we, we made it clear to people uh, what, what they're all about and what we're all about. So what is it that we want from Chevron? We want to implement, they have a retooling of the project. We want to make sure that project makes the refinery as clean and safe as possible. We want sustainable quality jobs and of course transitioning to um, renewable jobs. Uh, we want and training of the workers as well for uh, renewable jobs. We want damages from the 2014 fire. Next. I'm sorry, 2012 fire. Um, so these are local struggles, but they gain national attention. We can make a difference from the local level. Our model, we think, is replicable to an extent. Every city has its own issues, right? Not everybody has a Chevron, you know, and you know, we're lucky, I guess, because we, we could wage a, a strong battle and really reach people about the corporate culture we're facing. But you know, there's bad developments, there's all kinds, there's other corporations that other cities can fight. And uh, so we think our model is replicable and bringing people together, coalition building, grassroots movement building. We made national attention, New York Times, PBS, Bill Moyers, um, LA Times, uh, Rachel Maddow, uh, Maddow Show. So we, we got around, uh, uh, people thought we were really um, doing something unique by fighting this big oil behemoth. Next. So um, our basic strategy, like I said, is volunteer participation um, and starting early. We started actually in 2013 for the 2014 campaign. We had a campaign called I Love Richmond. Uh, we had people going door to door, having people sign uh, petitions that they stand with me, the mayor at the time, saying they love Richmond and we will not forget the Chevron fire. So on one side of a beautiful card said, I love Richmond, and the back was a picture of the fire. We will not forget Chevron stop polluting our air and our elections. So we educate, you know, all through election years and non-election years, and we use our money creatively. Here's uh, some of our candidates, uh, so some of our campaign workers. We had hundreds out there. Um, you know, it, it was an energizing campaign. Uh, many, many people uh, in our diverse community felt empowered uh, with the campaign alone and, of course, with the victory. Next. Next, please. Next. Is it not working? <laughs> it's stuck. <laughs> so, all right. So, and the other thing we do is we bring out the successes. I mean, I, I've been, I'm in my 11th year as an elected official in Richmond, so we have done a lot, and it's been by way of this movement and this coalition building. One of the things we've done is reduced crime significantly. I mean, Richmond had, in the 90s, had 61 homicides. The first year I was mayor, there were um, 47 homicides. By the time, the last, in 2014, we had 11. Now that's a 75% decrease, the lowest homicide rate in, in 33 years. So we, we addressed the roots of the violence. We had outreach teams going um, out to the neighborhoods, former, formerly incarcerated individuals who can talk to the young men involved in violence and um, violence prevention um, activities and programs. So we made a difference by not just having police out and we made sure we had a community involved police force. So um, we made some changes. Next. So we, we think that in 2014, Richmond was the place where David confronted today's Goliath and won. Yeah. But next. <laughs> but a community defining its own destiny has more battles to fight. Next. There's some people uh, standing up to Wall Street outside of City Hall. We know income inequality is uh, something we, we have to change in this country. And how do we do that on, the, on a local level? Next. So one of the ways is we um, work on fair taxation. From Chevron in particular, in 2008, a citizen's ballot measure um, 
taxing large manufacturers, predominantly, almost overwhelmingly, Chevron would have been taxed. Um, we, the voters passed the measure. Unfortunately, the courts overturned it, um, at, but on a technicality, and, and we were getting ready to put out another ballot measure to tax them. So they came to the table. They knew the momentum of people uh, building movements and uh, standing up for their interests versus Chevron's interests. So they settled for $114 million into our city's coffers over 15 years. So that was a big success. Next. Next. Okay. Um, we passed a minimum wage increase. Of course, this chart shows all, um, all kinds of prices going up and all kinds of... Uh, um, situations where the, the working families of Richmond and other communities have to pay more from their pockets, but they're not getting an, any more in their pockets. There is no minimum wage increase, and the magnifying glass is looking for it. So we in Richmond said, we're going to do something about it. So we did pass um, a minimum wage increase that will go up to $13 an hour in a phased-in approach, giving our small businesses a chance to uh, kind of prepare for that. So uh, we think, and of course, we want it to go up even higher. Next. Um, it's in, in three, three years. And then after that, a CPI increase every year after that. But, you know, we, would, we didn't have the votes for any higher. We may have it going forward, and we would like to go higher. Um, Worker-owned co-ops is another way. This is our uh, Latina, uh, Fusion Latina uh, catering service. Uh, workplace democracy, very important. Next. Next, I'm going to go kind of fast here because I know my time is limited. We have a Richmond municipal ID. We have a large immigrant community. A third of our um, community is our immigrants. And um, we uh, made sure we have an ID that is open to everyone in Richmond, regardless of immigration status, incarceration status, homeless status, et cetera. So here is, then we go to the housing crisis, which is, um, Ongoing in our midst as we speak. A lot of wealth was lost over the recession. Next. Hmm. It's not coming up fully here. Is that all you have on the? Try it again. <laughs> okay, so basically what that says, and I think I have my hard copy here, is... Uh, Oh, it's coming up slowly, I see. <laughs> um, that nationally, prior to, this is national statistics, prior to the recession, over 80% of all households, um, wealth in black and Latino households um, was comprised of home equity. That was where their wealth was. And, um, you know, it's true for lots of people, but in uh, African American and, uh, and Latino households, we have that statistics that it was 80% of their household wealth. Well, they lost um, over half the cumulative uh, net worth of all black and Latino households um, due to the foreclosure crisis. Next. Ah, there it is, the money going out the window. Okay. <laughs> Next. And so what we do in Richmond is we try and restore community wealth. We uh, know that we want to change the relationship between communities and Wall Street. We have many, many demonstrations. Um, in front of banks, in front of City Hall, um, making sure that people know that Richmond residents own their neighborhoods. We're not giving them up, although there's a big challenge here. Um, and so we have to have strategies. We want to fight back against the financialization of the economy. Next. So we had a program um, that got a lot of attention. It was called the Richmond Cares Program, otherwise known as the Eminent Domain Program. You may have heard of it. So it got a lot of attention. Um, underwater loans were to be acquired, either voluntarily or through the use of eminent domain, keeping homeowners in their homes um, while resetting the mortgages with a reduced principal and affordable payments. So we did a lot of work on that. Next. Really, really captured people's imagination because it's... It's really, really important that uh, every economic, e economist of every stripe understands that the way to solve the housing crisis is to reduce principal. And when the banks are holding on to the, the um, mortgages, the underwater mortgages, and forcing people out, um, 
it's not helping, helping our neighborhoods. So uh, we really wanted to do this next. That's some of the uh, news we had to, uh, we got as a result of this program. But unfortunately, Congress kicked eminent, the eminent domain program to the curb by, ba by passing a bill to ban insurance for uh, refinanced and replaced mortgages acquired through eminent domain, thereby killing the program. So we kind of put it aside. It's still there. I mean, we could still do it if we can, you know, work and change this, this bill from Congress. Um, but right now, it's kind of put on hold. But next. We have a new strategy, and it's uh, the same principle, keeping people in their homes to, but while, we, while their principles are reduced, and we utilize the help of good actors, nonprofits that uh, have a, a good mission. And what we are doing as cities, and it's not only Richmond, other elected officials in other cities are, are joining together for this, is to help these nonprofits, they're financially, um, they're financially oriented nonprofits who have acquired significant amount of money. So we're helping them, or we're urging HUD and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to um, sell the underwater mortgages and the delinquent mortgages to these nonprofits because otherwise they get bought out by Wall Street speculators who don't have our residents or our neighborhoods' interest at heart. The nonprofits will indeed reduce the principal, keep the homeowners in their homes, or if it's already foreclosed upon and it's vacant property, they will create affordable housing. So we are trying to work with, with these good partners. Next. So the challenge is that Wall Street private equity firms and hedge funds are getting to these pools of delinquent mortgages first and outbidding the nonprofit. So that's a challenge. Next. So what our plan is to have city governments step in and urge the, these um, major investors to sell the troubled mortgages to the partner nonprofits. And we have, there are community groups and others that are really rallying around this to put pressure on investors and build a public awareness campaign. Because we have a choice. Our housing is sold to Wall Street speculators or our troubled mortgages get in the hands of a nonprofit partner. Next. Uh, I'm going to go a little quickly here. Um, just, this is just saying how we're doing this. Um, we passed resolutions. Uh, Richmond was the first, and other cities have. Uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors passed a resolution supporting this effort. And I'll be in Washington, D.C. next week um, to meet, and there'll be like 15 to 20 other elected officials and community leaders that will be meeting with HUD and meeting with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac representatives to urge them to sell and the nonprofit leaders will be there as well. So we're going to you know, start this uh, really high pressure, um, pressure uh, campaign to get them to do the right thing. So now we have a, a very current thing um, in terms of uh, what is happening in Richmond. We have a, uh, we passed a rent control and just cause for eviction ordinance. I know in LA you have rent control. Well, we passed the first ordinance in 33 years um, in California on this level. So it's been dead for a while. You know, it's great for those cities that have, have had it in place and it's wonderful. We just wanted to join all of you. And so um, we did, we got a majority to pass it. But unfortunately, um, the 30 days before the ordinance could go into effect, the California Apartments Association did a fraudulent petition gathering process where they gathered all these uh, signatures um, paying $20 a signature, which is unprecedented. And I mean, can people, signature gatherers, and I guess there's like a profession of signature gathering, and people converged on Richmond from all over the state. So it was a high pressure uh, campaign and they lied to people. They said it would strengthen re rent control when in reality it's to uh, suspend it. So if enough signatures qualify, um, 
go back a bit. If enough signatures qualify, a well-funded landlord campaign, California Apartments Association, will have stopped temporarily the decision of a democratically progressive, independent elected council to provide tenant stability in a gentrifying market. Over half of our residents in Richmond are renters. And the prices in the Bay Area are just skyrocketing in Richmond as well, but we want to stop it. So, they're not going to stop us. We will not be deterred. We will win this at the battle. So, at the ballot. And it will be a battle <laughs> because the California Apartment Association will no doubt spend a lot of money. They spent $100,000 in a month to uh, get the signature gathering process um, underway. Next. So, um, basically, we're uh, committed to gain greater community control over our housing, our neighborhoods, and our lives. Next. So, we're one city in Richmond, and that's what we're working on. We have our challenges. You know, the community isn't always in agreement on everything, but that's our goal. One Richmond, and also one world. Future victories will require growth of our movement beyond Richmond. We know movements are everywhere. The Black Lives Movement we connect with, we're inspired by. Um, you know, every other movement that exists in cities or nationally that uh, has the community's interest at stake, we're there and we want to unite. Uh, we know that Citizens United must be reversed, right? And uh, our, our democracy is what's at stake here. So uh, we want to unite with all whose vision matches ours and whose efforts will help in the challenges ahead. And we all know, as Frederick Doug Douglass said, no progress without struggle. So thank you all for being a part of this movement. <laughs> thank you.